are on the south bank of the West Fork of the White River. We're about four miles upriver from Newberry, Indiana. What you're looking at is a railroad trestle that crosses the West Fork of the White River. The trestle was built about 1910. But what we're going to focus on at this point is precisely directly across the river on the northern bank. You're going to see a stone pier in the center of your screen. That stone pier is the northern pier of what would have been a towpath bridge that would have crossed right at this point carrying traffic from the White River up from Newberry, Indiana toward Worthington and Terre Haute, Indiana. You would have had slack water navigation right to this point. You would have then towed the canal boats across the river on a bridge precisely at this point to that hump. That hump is towpath and again that stone pier is the last remaining stone pier of what would have been a towpath bridge that would have crossed the west fork of the White River. Now the towpath is just east of this gully. This gully is the Wabash and Erie Canal. More precisely, Lock 59 of the Wabash and Erie Canal. The lock would have entered the river at an angle from the bank right there down to this point. That tree, you can see its trunk is white, is on the southwest corner of what would have been Lock 59. There is some stone and woodwork that you can see of Lock 59 when the river is a bit lower. Right now, the river, according to the Newburgh, excuse me, Newberry gauge, is six feet nine inches high. When the river is about one foot six inches high, you can see the lock. A little bit more on the towpath bridge. We're straight in line with the stone abutment across the river. But I want you to observe the river itself. You'll notice several ripples. These ripples are little islands that will appear once the river gets down below two feet. These ripples have foundations to the other stone piers that once stood here and brought the towpath bridge across the river. Again, right now the river is about six feet nine inches deep according to the gauge at Newberry. But we're going to look focus here on the southern shoreline. That green mass there is the southern abutment of the towpath bridge. And that towpath bridge would have continued on from that point. And we're going to focus here on the extreme southern bank of the White River. And you're going to see several several uh, stumps sticking out of the ground. These stumps supported the towpath bridge all the way to the northern, or I'm sorry, southern bank of the West Fork of the White River. Again, just to put this in perspective, when they built the rail bridge that is just upriver, they did the exact same thing. The last couple piers from the southern side went from concrete to wood, wood, and more wood. And that's exactly what they did with the towpath bridge. This would have been the southern end of the towpath bridge. Thus, the towpath road would have started precisely at that point and carried four miles down in this direction toward Newberry. Just one last perspective of the towpath crossing of the West Fork of the White River. Again, four miles upriver from Newberry, Indiana. The canal boats would have entered the river at an angle from just west of those stone piers into Lock 59 and into the river 
right about where that tree trunk is, that white tree trunk in the center of your screen. And the towpath traffic would have crossed from the towpath on the northern bank, that green mound right in the center of your screen, onto those wooden stakes that you can see on the shoreline, onto at least sto four stone piers, one of which you can still see, all the way across on these wooden piers, and then onto the shoreline of the south bank of the West Fork of the White River. The towpath would have then turned somewhere here and headed downriver four miles toward Newberry, Indiana. We are now on the north shore of the West Fork White River, four miles upriver from Newberry, Indiana. The river has now gone down considerably. Before it was about seven feet high. Now, according to the gauge at Newberry, is about three feet high. And we can see more of the details of the towpath bridge. In the center of the screen is the aforementioned pier. Behind that pier, you can see two islands. We're gonna zoom in on those islands. You can see how those islands are riddled with cut stone, especially the one that's currently in the center of your screen. You can see how there is a flat spot. That is the foundation for a pier that once existed on that spot, but has since washed out. These would be three of, well, we don't know how many piers would have crossed the river at this point, but at least three stone piers would have, cro would have held up a towpath bridge at this point would have crossed the river to the south bank and would have carried the towing path to Newberry four miles downriver from this point. We're gonna turn northward and you're gonna see a grassy hump in front of you. Right there. This is the towing path. This is the towing path approach off of the towing path bridge. And this gully that you see here is the Wabash and Erie Canal. More specifically, the northern end of Lock 59 that will carry the Wabash and Erie Canal into the White River on the northern end of the slack water navigation. We have now moved down into the Wabash and Erie Canal from the towing path. We're looking northward and we're going to turn toward the south, toward the riverside. Here you can get a almost a decent little view of the prism from the towpath side down into the canal. And this essentially is the drop off of Lock 59. We're going to move in a little closer here. It is very overgrown here, so it's a little hard to manage my way through here, but okay, we are at the edge of the canal, more specifically Lock 59, and there's a significant drop off about 12 feet behind, below me, but right there, there is the 1910 railroad trestle and the towing path bridge pier. We're going to move a little down river and here you're going to see a little bit of wooden stonework. This is the southwest section of Lock 59 where the canal would essentially merge with the West Fork of the White River and we continue slack water navigation down river four miles to Newbury, Indiana. We're gonna try to get a closer look at this. We are now getting a better view of the ruins of what would be the southwest corner of Lock 59 of the Wabash and Erie Canal. The 
This is where the Wabash Erie Canal would have joined the White River and used slackwater navigation for four miles downriver from this point to Newberry, Indiana. Again, one more overview of the lock from the northern shoreline of the West Fork White River. We are now at the river surface level of the ruins of Lock 59. This would be the southwest section of the lock. What you're looking at is the northern bank of the West Fork White River. And there are plenty of cut stones and timbers embedded into the northern bank. And this whole site is just littered with all kind of artifacts such as canal timbers, cut stone with mason marks, and most notably, lots of ironwork. A uh, shout out to Preston Rickhart, an Alar Canal Society of Indiana member who pointed this out last year, who actually found this entire site last year. This is one of the hydraulic slide gates that would allow water in and out of the lock, allowing the boat to either move up to the Worthington or Terre Haute level or down to the surface of the White River. But it's very amazing that this has somehow survived 170 years, most of the year underwater. And again, there's plenty of old iron work at this site. We're just going to continue moving down to the edge of the lock. You can see there lots of, uh, lots of woodwork at the very edge of lock 59. As the canal boats adhere to the west fork of the White River and travel four miles slack water navigation down to Newberry, Indiana. I also want to note this tree right here because I had noted it early on the video how its roots you see right there actually rest on the corner of the lock. You can see right there the wooden foundation and that would be literally the southwest corner of Lock 59. I'm going to swing up onto the shoreline and give you a perspective from a little further downstream of the southwest corner of the lock. One more detail of the southwest corner of Lock 59. You can really see how this was a composite lock, how it was constructed both of wood and cut stone. But this would be the southern wall facing the river on the southwestern edge of Lock 59. We are now standing in the prism of the Wabash and Erie Canal. We are looking south toward the north bank of the West Fork of the White River and essentially Lock 59. We're going to turn toward the north and it's going to be rather hard to locate Lock 58 as it is rather overgrown here. But I'll show another perspective a little further north at this point. But I just want to make note of something. This entire valley is scattered with all kinds of cut stone. This is a great example because it actually still has a maker's mark. The triangle with a cross in the middle of it. But this just goes to show all the stonemasons leaving their mark almost 200 years ago. We are now 500 feet north of the West Fork White River. Right now we're looking south toward the river. Up there is the towpath with the approach to the towpath bridge. 
down here is the canal and we're looking toward lock 59. Between lock 59 and approximately where lock 58 is, there's a very notable wide section of canal where it basically stretches from the towpath to the hillside. And our suspicions here are this is a place where canal boats could wait in the event of heavy traffic through the two locks, which are only about 500 feet apart. We're going to turn toward the north. In particular, you're going to see a fairly large oak tree. On the other side of this oak tree, we have a berm starts to form where you didn't have a berm before, and we get a very narrow channel of canal and the canal essentially starts to move uphill. We do believe this is the approximate location of Lock 58. Again, we're moving up to about 600 feet north of where the canal would move into Lock 59 and into the White River. And at this point, you can start to see the berm disappear, and the canal disappears, and it moves into the earthworks of the towpath. And I'll explain that in a second here. But again, beyond these trees, we can see how the prism reforms beyond that little, that little open meadow and moves uphill to here into what we believe is Lock 58. Just want to give a perspective from the towpath of the approximate site of Lock 58. Again, this is the towpath looking south toward the river. Down here, we see the meadow in the distance. And here, the canal narrows and very slowly increases in height up to near the surface of the towpath. We are now looking south toward the river, once again, about 700 feet north of that river. On the left side of your screen is the towpath. On the right side of your screen is the Wabash and Erie Canal. Uh, we're about 100, maybe 75 to 100 feet north of where we think Lock 58 is located. Um, I want to make note, if we move to the left here, you're going to notice another set of earthworks. These earthworks belong to the railroad approach to the trestle that crosses the West Fork of the White River, just upriver from the towpath bridge. We're going to turn northward, and you're going to see the towpath and the canal essentially, well, for lack of better words, merge with the railroad earthworks. Now, the railroad earthworks predate the canal by almost half a century, but something notable happens just north of this point. The canal and the towpath, for lack of better words, pass through the railroad earthworks and come out on the east side of the railroad earthworks where the railroad earthworks become part of the canal berm. And we'll see that here in a sec. We are now on the railroad earthworks, again, built in the early 20th century. Just below here is the canal towpath, and below that is the Wabash and Erie Canal. Now the canal will move through the earthworks. We're now looking north and over here. Again, those are the railroad earthworks. And you can see right here on the east side of the railroad earthworks, once again, another gully forms, and that is the Wabash and Erie Canal. So at this point, about 800 feet north of the, White, or the West Fork of the White River, 
the railroad earthworks become the berm side of the canal and you've got a little section of preserved Wabash Neary with a towpath that still sticks well above the bottom land of the White River. Just want to give one last perspective. We're now 900 feet north of the West Fork White River. We are on what would essentially be the berm of the Wabash and Erie Canal and what in the 20th century was utilized as a railroad. We're going to look a little east. There you have the dry bed of preserved Wabash and Erie Canal. And just beyond there, the towpath. This is very unusual, especially studying the canal in Vandenberg and Warwick counties where the towpath rather than the berm was utilized for railroads later in the 1880s all the way up through the 1930s. But at least north of the West Fork Wright River all the way, possibly to Worthington, the berm is the earthworks of the 20th Century Railroad and the towpath has been left alone. I hope you enjoyed this video, this mini tour of the Wabash and Erie Canal through Greene County, Indiana.